If it's been over 250 years since your first ancestor came to America and 150 years since the last one came, what are the odds that almost every one of your ancestors could ultimately be traced back to the same country? Well, I don't know the answer to that question, but what I do know is that if your religious heritage is that of being Mennonite or Amish, the odds are pretty good. This is the case with my family, made up of Hoolies, Hirelies, Zooks, Schlegels, Hochstetlers, and Roths, and lots of tangled family tree vines of Yoders, Hertzlers, Berkeys, Mass, and many, many other family names. In some cases, these names are found on both sides of my family, and they all originally came from the same place in the world. Where is that place? It's right here in Switzerland. Hi, my name is Doug Hooley. There's supposedly 1,958 Hooleys living in the United States right now. Well, where'd we all come from? What about all the Hirelys and the Slagles and the Zugs and the Roths and the Myers and the Herstlers and the Hochstetlers? Where'd they all come from? When I was a kid, I had no idea where my family came from. I'd ask my dad, and he thought maybe we came from the Netherlands since my grandpa used to speak what he called Pennsylvania Dutch. Then, someone told my dad that Hooli was an Irish name. In Ireland, after all, Hooli is the word used for a wild and raucous party. Then someone tried to sell him a family crest and coat of arms saying that Hooli was a Welsh name. My mom told me that her mother's family came from a region in Alsace-Lorraine, France, so I thought maybe I had some French blood coursing through my veins. She knew her grandpa on her father's side spoke German, so she assumed the Hirely family was from Germany. I grew up attending a Mennonite Brethren church but somewhere along the lines, my family's heritage got lost. So I thought, okay, I'm a typical melting pot American of European descent, and I was fine with that. You can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family. What I eventually found out was that although many of my ancestors came by way of areas along the Rhine River in both France and Germany, almost all of them can be traced back to Switzerland. The Pennsylvania Dutch they spoke was actually Swiss German. The word for German in the German language is Deutsch, and many of the Mennonites and Amish settled in Pennsylvania, thus the term Pennsylvania Dutch. And my ancestry is not unique. All of this is the case with many people of Swiss, Amish, and Mennonite heritage. Because of the Mennonite and Amish cultural importance placed on marrying within the specific denominational faith, it was not common for people who came from such a background to marry outside of the faith until my parents or my generation. Ever since the Tower of Babel, people have stuck together with other people that speak their own language, and since the bulk of the Amish came from Switzerland, and Mennonites came to America from both Switzerland and the Netherlands, the Swiss Amish and Mennonites remained a pretty homogenous, tight-knit group for literally hundreds of years, even after immigrating to America. This is a story of where so many of our Swiss, Amish, and Mennonite ancestors came from, and why they would have left such a beautiful place. My traveling companions on this trip were my wife Angela and my sister Sally. Our trip to Switzerland took place in September. Besides just wanting to witness the legendary beauty of Switzerland, we set out to see the cities, villages, and farmlands our ancestors lived in, and the sites where important Anabaptist historical events took place. You might not be familiar with the term Anabaptist. Anabaptists are Christians who believe in delaying baptism until they confess their faith in Jesus as an adult, as opposed to being baptized as an infant. The word Anabaptist literally means again baptizer or rebaptizer. Those of the Amish and Mennonite faiths, or those who came out of those faiths, are direct descendants of the Anabaptist movement. In this video, I'm not going to either lavish praise upon or place judgment upon the founders and early followers of the Anabaptist movement or try to explain in detail the doctrines they held to or why they held to them. Rather, I'm going to focus on where they came from before they came to America and what led them to decide to leave such a beautiful place. I'm going to tell this story through the historical lens of my own ancestors' experience. Theirs was a typical Anabaptist story. If you have ancestors of Mennonite and Amish heritage, chances are their experience was very similar. Their unsympathetic Swiss neighbors would come to call them Teufers. It translates as Dunkers. But this is a story about so much more than an incredibly beautiful country, my family's heritage, and a difference of opinion over how and when to be baptized. 
This is a story about incredible faith in God and conviction to live out that faith. This story begins long before I can trace my family's history back to. See, Switzerland hasn't always been the peaceful, neutral picture of efficiency, fine chocolates, watchmaking, and cheese that it is today. Okay, so I don't know about the part about cheese being true, but Switzerland has a long and thick history of internal strife, fighting, arguing, wars, independent oh. thinking, contention, stubbornness, and renegade beliefs. My wife Angela tells me that's not hard to believe. I don't know what she's talking about. Mystery. The Swiss of the Middle Ages descended mainly from a Celtic tribe known as the Helvetians and the conquering Romans who had settled there. The first Roman legion, likely formed by Julius Caesar, was stationed around Cologne, Germany as early as 16 BC. Rome's influence and bloodlines would have surely been present in the region known now as Switzerland ever since that time. Sometime after 9 AD, the 13th Roman legion was stationed within Switzerland, and in the next decades, two more Roman legions would be stationed there in order to try and maintain order amongst the disorderly Celtic people. Surprisingly, it was the Roman Theban Legion from Egypt that first took a strong stand for Jesus in Switzerland. The actual facts are controversial, but this large group of Roman soldiers was garrisoned in the city of Thebes, Egypt. Emperor Maximian ordered the legion to march to Gaul in order to assist with the uprising taking place. When they had reached the city now known as St. Marie, Switzerland in the year 286, the legion was ordered to make a sacrifice to Emperor Maximian. However, the group had converted in mass to Christianity and refused to make such a sacrifice. Subsequently, the order was handed down to decimate the legion. That meant to execute one out of every ten soldiers until they had changed their minds. Well, no one ever did. The decimation was allegedly repeated until all 6,666 were dead. According to an 8th century legend, two siblings named Felix and Regula were members of the famed Theban Legion. After they learned what was going to happen to them, they fled the execution. They made it as far as Zurich when they, along with their servant, were caught, tried, and executed. After the three of them were decapitated, the legend goes that they stood to their feet, picked up their heads, and walked 40 paces uphill, and there they laid down and finally died. They were buried on the hilltop they died on, which became the building site of the Grossmünster Church in Zurich. This story had such an impact on the locals that the picture of the three martyrs is contained on the seal of the city of Zurich. In the year 346, Christianity got a foothold in Switzerland when the Bishopric of Basel was established. At that time, Christianity was competing with the local pagan practices. Like everyone else, except for the Jews, my ancestors were pagan Gentiles at one time. Among their practices was the worship of Roman gods that had been introduced by the legions stationed in Switzerland. The Helvetians were known to worship a bear goddess by the name of Arteo. On Christmas Day in the year 800, the church and the state were officially married. That was the day that Charlemagne was crowned emperor of the Holy Roman Empire by Pope Leo III. The empire included the region that Switzerland is located in. The kingdom was divided up into many subunits, but all of the royalty, such as the German princes, received their authority to rule from the Roman Catholic Church. Consequently, everyone who lived under the authority of the Holy Roman Empire became Roman Catholic. Roman Catholicism remained the predominant religion in Europe until the Reformation of 1520. So it's safe to say that many of our Helvetic ancestors converted from the worship of a bear goddess to Roman Catholicism by the Middle Ages. Last names, surnames, or family names like Krupp and Roth were almost unheard of until the 13th and 14th centuries in Europe. Until that time, if you needed to identify two different people who shared the same name, you might add to their name what they did, like John Baker or John Butcher. Or they might follow their first name with their father's name, or even be identified by one of their characteristics like short. Sometimes those names stuck, other times families adopted names that identified them with geography of where they lived or what was important to them. Such is the case with the name Yoder, which is shortened from the name Theodorus. Don't try to tell me that if you're of Mennonite or Amish heritage that you're not at least distantly related to a Yoder. 
Saint Theodore was a monk who sometime in the 4th century crossed the Alps from Italy to establish a Catholic outpost in southern Switzerland. Apparently, the faithful Roman Catholic Yoder family of the Middle Ages felt a connection to this first documented Catholic bishop in Switzerland and took on his name. The first Yoders were known to inhabit a place in central Switzerland known now as Yodershubel, which translates as Yoder's Hill. The oldest documentation of Yoders goes all the way back to at least as far as the year 1260. That's way further back than my great-great-grandmother Rachel Yoder, or even her father Jacob. You have to go way back beyond Balthazar Yoder, at least three Casper Yoders, Yost, Heine, and Uli Yoder. You have to go back all the way to my 19th great-grandfather, Peter Yoder, to get to the year 1260. And they believe that the Yoder family was living in that region far before then. Today, there are more than 53,000 people with the last name of Yoder living in the U.S. Most can trace their ancestors all the way back to Yoder's Hill in the Emmental region of the canton of Bern near the town of Steffesburg. Yoder's back in the 13th and 14th centuries in my family line were marrying into families with last names like Habiger, Dreyer, Zug, and Gerber. I'm tied into the Yoder family line about a half dozen ways through as many marriages over the centuries. Not everyone in the Middle Ages held to the official state religion of the Roman Catholics. Such was the case with a small movement started by a man named Peter Waldo in the late 12th century. Those that followed him, called Waldensians, believed in the virtue of poverty and nonviolence. They held ethical integrity in high regard and preached a simple message of individual responsibility and holy living. They viewed all believers in Christ as priests, that every local church should be self-governed and not controlled by the Catholic Church, and they took a different view of the meaning of communion and baptism than the church in Rome. By 1215, the Waldensians were declared to be a heretical sect. Although always discouraged by the church of the state, their brand of faith spread northward into Switzerland. By 1399, there were at least 130 persons of the Waldensian religion living in the canton of Bern. Although there's no direct tie of the Waldensians to Swiss Anabaptists, it's easy to see similarities and possible influences. In fact, among those persecuted for the Waldensian faith are some of the oldest Swiss Anabaptist names such as Troyer, Stuckey, and Meyer. By the time the Protestant Reformation came around, most Waldensians embraced the Reformed belief systems and were absorbed into the new Reformed churches. The Protestant Reformation was born when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the Castle Church in Wittenberg, Germany in 1517 for all to see. Two men by the names of John Calvin of Geneva, Switzerland and Ehrlich Zwingli of Zurich would greatly help to define the Protestant Reformation. Central and Northern Europe began to drastically change. The Holy Roman Empire, once almost entirely Roman Catholic, was now being divided up into both Catholic and Protestant controlled states, and this never occurred peacefully. Northern Europe largely favored Luther and his Protestant ways. Southern Europe remained Catholic and Central Europe was a hotbed of contention and faith-based wars. Martin Luther's bold move at Wittenberg in 1517 came just 78 years after the invention of the printing press. Bibles began being translated from Latin into the common language of the people, printed and distributed, making it possible for people to read what the Bible actually said. Luther himself had translated and published the New Testament into the German language by 1522. A lot of things began to change during the Protestant Reformation, but two things that didn't initially change and was not supported by the leaders of the Reformation was the practice of infant baptism and the marriage of the church and state. Well, two men that became very aware of what the Bible had to say were Felix Manns and Conrad Grebel. In 1521, 23-year-old Conrad Grable joined a study group led by Ehrlich Zwingli in Zurich. It was there that Conrad met Felix Manns and developed a close friendship. Together, the group studied the Greek classics, the Latin Bible, the Hebrew Old Testament, and the Greek New Testament. In the spring of 1522, Grable became a strong supporter of the teachings of Zwingli and the Protestant Reform Movement. However, by a year and a half later, Grable and others had lost their respect for Zwingli. Zwingli argued before the Zurich City Council to do away with the sacrament of Mass. But the City Council, who controlled such matters within the Church, was not ready to go that far with the Church Reformation and told Zwingli to continue the Mass. Zwingli complied. Grebel and about 14 others of Zwingli's close supporters saw this as Zwingli putting man's wishes ahead of God's and so parted ways with him. They felt betrayed by Zwingli. The final issue that broke the ties between Zwingli and his former followers was infant baptism. 
The group saw no biblical basis for baptizing babies. Their teaching gained a following, and several families began to refuse to have their infants baptized. A public debate on infant baptism was held in Zurich at the Rathaus, or what we call Town Hall, on January 17, 1525. It took place between Ehrlich Zwingli and the trio of Conrad Grable, Felix Manns, and a former Roman Catholic priest named George Blaurock. The Zurich Council found Zwingli to be the winner of the debate and ordered Conrad, Manns, and Blaurock to cease their teachings. The council also ordered that all who had refused to have their infants baptized must have them baptized within eight days. The three men, along with their supporters, met together four days later in the home of Manns and his mother to decide what to do. It was there, in defiance of the Zurich City Council and the former friend Ehrlich Zwingli, that George Blaurock asked Grable to baptize him upon his confession of faith. After he was baptized, Blaurock baptized the others who were present at the meeting. Following the path of Johannes der Teufer, a.k.a. John the Baptist, Grable set out on a mission of evangelism to the surrounding cities, baptizing people as he went. Only two months after his own baptism, Grable had baptized several hundred others near St. Gallen, Switzerland. Felix Manns utilized his skills to translate passages of scripture into the common language and worked as an evangelist. He was arrested a number of times between 1525 and 1527. As he was preaching with George Blaurock outside of the city of Zurich, he was captured for the last time by surprise and imprisoned in Wellenberg Prison, which once stood in the middle of the Lamont River in Zurich. In 1526, the Zurich City Council had declared rebaptism to be punishable by drowning. Manns was the first to suffer this penalty on January 5, 1527. At 3 p.m., Manns was led from the Wellenberg prison to a boat. He was accompanied by a reformed minister who attempted to silence Manns' preaching to the people and his praise to God, and he hoped to give Manns an opportunity to recant. Instead, the crowd would hear Manns shout, O Lord Christ from heaven, I praise you for turning away my sorrow and sadness. Manns was brought to this spot on the Lamont River. His hands were bound and pulled behind his knees, and a pole was placed between them. He was executed by being baptized to death. King Ferdinand of Austria would declare drowning, called the third baptism, to be the best antidote to anabaptism. On the same day Manns was executed, former Catholic priest Blaurock was severely beaten and permanently expelled from Zurich through a gate that used to stand about here. Blaurock continued to preach in the Swiss cities of Bern, Biel, and Appenzell. Appenzell's population of Anabaptists quickly grew to 1,500 in number. Blaurock left Switzerland never to return. He would eventually be tortured and burnt at the stake for his beliefs 150 miles away from Zurich in northern Italy. So Conrad Grable, Felix Manns, and George Blaurock were following what Jesus said to do and not what the government was telling them to do. You know, and it might be hard to hear or accept, but maybe more importantly, they were following what Jesus wanted them to do rather than what the organized church of their day wanted them to do. Don't get me wrong. This wasn't some self-serving, sideline group of Christians that were basing their decisions on their feelings or what some radio talk show host said or some dubious theory that they had read on Twitter. This was a godly group of men that together had been diligently studying the Word of God. Within 10 years, there would be tens of thousands of Anabaptists across Switzerland, central and southern Germany, Moravia, Belgium, and the Netherlands. The movement spread like wildfire, and not because of favorable winds. Anabaptists were reviled by both Catholics and Protestants. Within 10 years after Anabaptists had their beginning, there were no less than 116 laws throughout German-speaking Northern Europe, making being an Anabaptist an offense punishable by death. Everyone wanted the Teufers out of their country, or dead. The German word for hunter is Jäger, while in Zermatt, he stayed at the Hotel Jägerhof, meaning the hunter house. The Anabaptists were relentlessly hunted down by the Teufer Jägers, or Dunker Hunters. In 1528, in southern Germany, the prince commissioned 400 mounted soldiers to be sent out to put to death all Anabaptists on whom they could lay their hands on. Somewhat later, the number of soldiers so commissioned was increased to 800, and eventually to 1,000. In Bavaria in 1527, the leaders ordered that Anabaptists should be drowned, 
unless they recanted, at which time they should be beheaded. When they were executed in Catholic-controlled areas, they were usually burnt at a stake. It's estimated that from 1527 to 1530, 1,000 Anabaptists were burned to death on pyres in the Inn Valley, which stretches from Switzerland through Austria to Germany. When Teufers were caught and convicted in Lutheran or Zwinglian-controlled Protestant states, they were executed either by beheading or drowning. Some had their fingers chopped off or they were tortured by being stretched on racks, occasionally to the point of dismembering and bleeding to death. Other times they were stretched so thin that the sun could reportedly be seen shining through their skin. The price of faith some Anabaptists paid was to have their tongues screwed down to their gums or they would have gunpowder stuffed into their pacifist mouths to be set on fire. Others were buried alive. It's estimated that the first 10 years of the Anabaptist movement saw at least 5,000 of its followers put to death. Ehrlich Zwingli once said that his struggle with the old church, the Roman Catholics, was child's play compared to his struggle with the Anabaptists. John Calvin once wrote of the Swiss brethren, these miserable fanatics have no other goal than to put everything into disorder. They reveal themselves to be the enemies of God and of the human race. Martin Luther believed these people, whose crime it was to be baptized as adults, to be not mere heretics, but open blasphemers. He came to eventually say that hell was sufficient punishment for the Anabaptists. So why in the world would the state care so much about what the Anabaptists were doing? There's a couple of reasons. The first is taxes. The state based the amount they were taxing on infant baptism records. If there was a sudden drop off in infant baptisms, the state wouldn't be collecting as much in taxes as they thought they needed. Secondly, the Anabaptists were refusing to fight as soldiers. Military service was compulsory. However, most of the fighting that was going on was as mercenaries in far off lands for somebody else's cause, or it was to push your either Protestant or Catholic beliefs on a neighboring state or defend your own state from a neighboring state's Protestant or Catholic beliefs. Well, the Anabaptists saw the error in this thinking. They noticed inconsistencies with the character and nature and teachings of Jesus with killing in Jesus' name. It just didn't line up. The bottom line is that the ever-growing number of Anabaptists were making it very difficult for the government to raise both taxes and an army. Hatred towards the Teufers was solidified in many people's minds when in 1535 some Anabaptists in Germany temporarily set aside a few of their important beliefs when they attempted to bring about the New Jerusalem and thousand-year reign of Jesus on earth. This uprising came to be known as the Munster Rebellion. For about a year and a half, a group of Anabaptists attempted to establish a theocracy when they took over the city of Munster in western Germany. The group took the city by force and installed their own government. Rebaptism became compulsory. All wealth was redistributed and shared in common. They took up the practice of polygamy and their enemies were put to the sword. One of the leaders of the rebellion declared himself to be the successor of King David and took himself 16 wives. After a lengthy resistance in January of 1536, the city was retaken and the Anabaptist leaders were captured and imprisoned. Three of the main leaders were tortured and executed in the marketplace of Munster. Their bodies were placed in cages which hung from the steeple of the church. The bones were removed later, but the cages still hang there today. The same month in 1536 that the Munster Rebellion came to an end, the son of a man named Simon from Friesland in the Netherlands renounced the Roman Catholic Church and embraced the beliefs of the Anabaptists. This former Catholic priest named Menno was soon well known and quickly became a leader in the movement. Menno Simon stressed the importance of nonviolence and rejected the ways that led to the Munster Rebellion, believing it was not scriptural. Menno's teaching spread, and by 1544 the Anabaptists in the Netherlands were known as Mennonites. Over the years, many Swiss brethren who also followed Menno Simon's teachings began to be known by that title. If you're being hunted down and you refuse to defend yourself or your beliefs through acts of violence, you have few options left available to help you survive. Among them are secrecy or hiding, evasion, and relocation. So, if you didn't already know, it's probably becoming pretty obvious by now why so many Swiss Anabaptist ancestors started leaving Switzerland and why so many of their descendants are now eating cheeseburgers in America rather than eating cheese fondue in Switzerland. The birthplace of the Anabaptists was Zurich. 
The movement initially involved educated people, usually of some means and status. However, partially because of the attractiveness of the separation of church and state to the overtaxed peasants living outside the cities, the movement became quickly very popular in the country, particularly in the cantons that had become Protestant, such as the canton of Bern. Beginning in the 1640s, there was a forced exodus of Anabaptists from the canton of Zurich. Some moved to Alsace, France, and at the conclusion of the Thirty Years' War in 1648, other Zurich refugees ended up going directly north and settling in the German Palatinate. However, many of the refugees also ended up in the canton of Bern, where there was initially more tolerance towards the Anabaptists. The canton of Bern is the second largest of the 26 Swiss cantons. It's located in west central Switzerland and is divided up into several regions. The most populated is the Bernese Midland, where the city of Bern is located. The city of Bern not only serves as the capital of the canton, but as the federal capital of Switzerland. The northernmost portion of the canton is the Bernese Jura, and the southernmost portion is the mountainous region of the Bernese Oberland. That's where some of the most beautiful and picturesque of the Swiss Alps can be found, including the Monk, Jungfrau, and Eiger, which in English translates as the Monk, Young Lady, and Ogre. Flowing down out of the Bernese Oberland Alps is the water that becomes the Aare River. The headwaters of the Aare flow south into Lake Brienz and then the Thuner Sea, or Lake Thun. The river then starts to head north, continuing through Switzerland, until it finally finds its way to the Rhine River. Over the years, the River Aare would see boats carrying away many exiled Anabaptists. The River Emmy flows through the Emmental Valley located in the canton of Bern. This valley, and in fact the entire area in an arc of about 20 to 25 miles to the east of the city of Bern, was the home of many Swiss brethren Anabaptists. The Emmental is primarily farmland, particularly dairy farmland. It's very famous for its cheese. In fact, even though there are many kinds of cheese made in Switzerland that the Swiss are famous for, Emmentaler cheese is what we in the United States know as Swiss cheese. There are quite a number of small villages throughout this region associated with the names of many Anabaptist ancestors. Villages like Sasseville, Landesville, Lutzelflu, Homburgbuchen, Schwarzenegg, Signau, and Heimesville. Some ancestors may have migrated to this area after the persecution began, but many of the families would have lived here before the rebaptizer movement. The oldest Mennonite church in existence is located in the village of Langnau. This church has been around since 1530. It was perhaps the most persecuted Anabaptist church in history. Meetings were once held in homes and in secret. It wasn't for 320 years that members were able to gather together freely without restriction from the authorities. Unfortunately, the Sunday we visited there, the church was closed as it was the date they had set for an out-of-town annual campout. The great thing was that we stumbled upon a local heritage celebration in which the town museum featured an exhibit which told the sad story of local Anabaptist persecution and exile. Little did the locals know that it was also the story of my own fourth great-grandmother, Barbara Lehman. The exhibit also had quite a number of artifacts from the period that the local Anabaptists were persecuted during. It gave us a great idea of their day-to-day -day lives, that is, when they weren't being chased out of the country or put in prison anyway. Like I said, my fourth great grandma, Barbara Lehman, who was the mother of Bishop Peter Schneck, was born in Langnau. Swiss Anabaptists who chose to stay in the area underwent a great deal of persecution. That's why many houses in the area had hidden rooms and trap doors built into them. Some of those hiding places still exist today.
In the middle of all these villages is Traxavald Castle. It's located near the village of Traxavald. The castle dates back to the 10th century and is known to have been used as a prison for countless Anabaptists who were rounded up by the Anabaptist hunters. The cells, which you can still go into in the multiple level tower, are dark, stuffy, and can be very cold. You can see graffiti on the walls from long ago, marking the days locked up. Unfortunately, you can also find graffiti from modern vandals. Anabaptists were held here until they could be sent into exile or sent to the executioner. Some were tortured here. Traxwald Castle was a dark place that only the light of Jesus could illuminate for those held there. Steffesburg, located next to the city of Thun, is where we spent three nights while in this area. Thun is just south of the Emmental region. So far, I've been able to trace 26 of my ancestors back to this town. Thanks to the Yoder family name, I can trace my roots here back all the way to the 14th century. A guy named Heine Yoder, my 16th great-grandpa, was born in Steffesburg in 1365. In fact, the Yoder family shield hangs on the wall of the Reformed Church in Steffesburg alongside the other shields of families of those who contributed to the construction and upkeep of the church. My ancestors who were born in Steffesburg after 1671 slow down a bit. 1671 is when the Bernese authorities became alarmed at the rapidly growing numbers of rebaptizers in their canton. This led to the second great period of exile and persecution of the Anabaptists. Remember, it wasn't that the Bernese leaders were particularly intimidated by what the rebaptizers believed. It had to do with the tax revenue stream slowing down and the Anabaptists' refusal to serve in the military. So, in response, the Gestapo-like Teufeljägers were again sent out to the countryside to round up the rebellious rebaptizers and bring them to justice. Some wealthy Anabaptists were sent to jail as hostages until the others agreed to go to prison in Bern or leave Switzerland altogether. It's reported that over 740 Anabaptists were exiled during this period of time. Some fled to the more sympathetic Jura Mountain region to the west. Others went north. As they traveled north on the Rhine River, some got off the boat to the left in Alsace, France, others to the right in Germany. For many, this was a temporary stopping place before families would eventually move on to America. Although most Anabaptist converts would have lived in the country, the city of Bern was the seat of government that ruled over them. The legend goes that Berchtold V, the founder of the city of Bern, vowed to name the city after the first animal he met on the hunt. As it turns out, it was a bear. The bear has been the animal on Bern's seal and coat of arms from at least early in the 13th century. Keeping live bears in the city bear pits dates back to the 1440s. There are many architectural features that date back before the Anabaptist movement of the 16th century. 
Many buildings were in existence that the dozen of my ancestors that can be traced back to living in and around the city of Bern would have been familiar with. That includes my 10th great-grandma, Anna Strite, born in 1687, and my double 9th great-grandpa, Bishop Jacob Hertzler. It also includes my 3rd great-grandpa, John J. Hirely, who in 1844, at the age of 11, immigrated to the United States. All of them would have been familiar with the same sites that can be seen today. Even if they weren't from the city, many Anabaptists were brought to Bern as prisoners. This is Kaffigturn, or Kaffig's Tower. It was the men's jail for Anabaptist prisoners. Just down the street is the site where the women's Anabaptist jail once stood. One of the places in the earlier days that the Anabaptists would have been brought to was in this area. A large chair once stood here. It was the place where charges were announced against the Anabaptists and it was decided whether they would be drowned, burnt at the stake, beheaded, or hanged. Later on, during a kinder and gentler era, the Anabaptist Swiss brethren would only lose all of their possessions and be exiled. That's when they would be taken to the Ari River and sent downstream. Such was the case during the third great period of persecution and exile of 1709 to 1711. In 1709, a mandate went out to again hunt down Anabaptists. Many didn't wait around to be rounded up and fled to the Alsace and Ura Mountain regions. However, immediately following the mandate, 61 Mennonites were captured and imprisoned in Bern. A year later, 56 of them, mainly sickly, were loaded on a boat and sent down the Ari River to Holland. In 1711, the Bernese government again made a serious attempt to eradicate the Anabaptists from the Bernese countryside. They ordered five ships to carry exiled Anabaptists out of Switzerland. The 328 souls they rounded up were only enough to fill four ships. Those who left under these circumstances lost all of their possessions. About here's where they would have said goodbye to Switzerland forever. After this attempt to eradicate the Teufers, only a few of them remained in the Emmental Valley. Most who remained lived in remote and isolated places. Located in the Bernese Midland is another famous cheese-making village called Gugusberg. It was once known as the poorest municipality in the canton of Bern. My fifth great-grandfather, Bishop Jacob Mast, who immigrated to America and settled in Pennsylvania along with his wife Magdalena Hooley, was born in Gugusburg. So were his father, Jacob Sr., his grandfather, Hans, and grandmother, Anna Mischler, and Bishop Mast's great-grandfather, Uli Mast, and Uli's wife, Elsie Byler, and his great-great-grandfather, Peter Mast. Presumably, the Mast family has been living in Gugusburg long before the Mast can be traced back to around 1570. Well, because of some family tree, let's call it vininess, on my dad's side, I even have some Gugusburg ancestors I'm related to in more than one way. Jacob Byler, for example, is a triple paternal fifth and sixth great-grandfather. It's no wonder I love Gugusburg cheese so much. About four and a half miles as the crow flies from Gugusburg is the small community of Winterkraut, the home of my double seventh great-grandfather, Jacob Hochstetler Sr., born in 1671. Jacob married a lady named Margaret Nabel, and sometime prior to 1704, they were forced to leave their home and possessions in Winterkraut. They, like many others, moved to Alsace, France. It's said that Jacob Sr. made several trips back to the area around Winterkraut in order to assist other Anabaptists in their escape in sort of an Anabaptist underground railroad. Twelve miles and a few valleys to the south of Gugusburg is the village of Erlenbach. Erlenbach is found in the Semmental Valley. That's where you'll find the birthplace of a well-known Teufer named Jacob Amon, who's generally credited with the founding of the Amish Church. Jacob was likely baptized as a child in the Erlenbach Reformed Church in 1644.
Sometime later, Jacob moved to the village of Oberhofen, located on the shores of the Thuner Sea, where he worked as a successful tailor. There were many Anabaptists living in the area of Oberhofen and another hillside village just down the Thuner Sea shore called Sigrisville. That's where the Anabaptist family name of Amstutz is thought to mainly come from. The name Amstutz means on the steep. I ran into some Amstutzes from Indiana by way of Ohio who were staying in Sigrisville while in Switzerland. According to a letter dated 1680, Jacob Amon had become infected with the Anabaptist sect. That's also the same year he was escorted to the border and told to leave Switzerland. He became an Anabaptist minister and eventually would, like many other Anabaptists, move to the Alsace region. In 1693, Jacob took issue with some Mennonite leaders with regards to what he saw as a lack of discipline. The lack of discipline in Jacob's eyes was chiefly displayed through not strictly adhering to the practice of banning those who left the Mennonite church after being baptized there. Other issues were as minor as when it was appropriate for a man to be clean-shaven and also included how many times a year to take communion. Amon identified closely with the practices of the Dutch Mennonites which included foot washing in conjunction with communion. This was not practiced by the Swiss. Those who followed after Jacob Amon's stricter doctrines eventually became known as Amish. My eighth great-grandfather Isaac Kaufman Sr. was a contemporary of Jacob Amon as well as a man who was often on the run. Isaac was born in Jacob's village of Erlenbach in 1653. He was living in the area of the Amital when his arrest was ordered in 1694. He escaped after his arrest along with his friend Hans Raber. Isaac spent time as a Teufer preacher in the village of Hamburg near the city of Thun. Records show he was again in jail, but this time in Bern in 1699. At that time, he was to be deported to Holland or the West Indies, but it never happened, as he was either released or escaped. He is known to have lived in the Alsace area in 1700, where he signed a letter along with Jacob Amon, after which he went back to Switzerland, where he was arrested and escaped yet again. Fleeing the Teufel hunters could take you to some beautiful places. By 1709, Isaac was living in Grindelwald, Switzerland. While in Grindelwald, he and several others signed a lease with the Prince of Montbelliard, France, to farm the land in that area. He remained there until 1711, when they were all ordered out of the country. Isaac died in Steffesburg in 1741, where all of his children had been baptized. As you've seen, many people fled Switzerland to the region known as Alsace. Of course, Alsace never moves, but who has control over it has changed many times over the years, leading to some confusion. Depending on the year ancestors migrated to America, they may have been recorded as either coming from Germany or France. Parts of Alsace have even been considered a part of the Swiss Confederated States in the past. Many Anabaptist families settled in the Alsace region because they received breaks on paying taxes in exchange for bringing their well-known superior farming techniques with them. Also in exchange for their knowledge and labor, they were given the right to meet and were not expected to participate in the military. The Mennonite and Amish view of the land was that of being obedient to Adam's original commission to be a gardener and good steward of the land. It was not to get rich and build an empire, but to be self-sufficient to a point where they could take care of their family well. St. Marie is the main village where Jacob and Mon settled when he migrated to Alsace. It's also where my seventh great-grandfather, Jacob Hochstetler, settled when he was driven from his home in Winterkraut, Switzerland. Because of the tightness of the Mennonite community, I'd often wondered if my mother and father had a common ancestor. It turns out there's at least a couple of them. One set of them meets on the corner of Hochstetler and Hochstetler. Jacob Hochstetler had a son he named after himself. Jacob Jr. immigrated to America and settled in Berks County, Pennsylvania, where he married Anna Lorenz. Together, they had a son named John. John is in my mother's ancestral line. Later, they had another son named Joseph. Joseph is in my father's ancestral line. Jacob Jr.'s family is well known for an event known as the Hochstetler Massacre that took place during the French and Indian War. But that's an interesting and tragic story for another time. Jacob Hochstetler and Jacob Amon actually settled outside of a small village called Eschery, just up the road from St. Marie. It's beautiful there.
People living around the area of St. Marie became vocally jealous of the Amish and Mennonites not having to serve in the military or pay taxes. In response, in 1712, King Louis XIV of France ordered all the Anabaptists out of the area. So because of their beliefs, it was time to move again. Some hid out in the hills. Since Jacob Hochstetler Sr. died in St. Marie in 1732, he must have been one of them. Others moved to more tolerant areas, including the German Palatinate, North America, and to the southern Alsace region around the cities of Mulhouse and Belfort. Both of those cities are located within 15 miles of the Swiss border. Located pretty close to the cities of Mulhouse and Belfort and only three miles from the Swiss border is the village of Grand Villars, France. Grand Villars is the closest village to my fifth great-grandfather, Nicholas Schlegel's farm, where he married and lived with his young wife, Magdalena Ummel. Nicholas's grandson and great-grandson would one day immigrate to Ontario, Canada, and then move south to Iowa and Nebraska. Fifteen miles to the southeast of Grand Villars is the Jura mountain range, which helps to separate France from Switzerland. The Juras are one of the first places that the Anabaptists living in the Emmental fled to once the persecution began. The authorities there were sympathetic enough to let them attempt to farm the rocky mountainous lands above 3,000 feet. My fifth great-grandfather, Christian Schneck, his wife Maria Aby, his son Christian Jr., and his wife Barbara Lehman, all from the Emmental region, relocated to the Jura. Barbara Lehman gave birth to a son there named Peter. Peter married another girl from the Emmental named Maria Falb. And they sailed to America and settled in Ohio where Peter became Bishop Peter Schneck and helped to establish the Sonnenberg Mennonite Church outside of Kidron. Peter's daughter Elizabeth married my great-great-grandfather John J. Hirely, who immigrated to Ohio from Bern, Switzerland at the age of 11 to live with the Schnecks. The Jura Mountains area around Corgamont, Switzerland was where the original Swiss Sonnenberg Mennonite Church was located. Today there are several locations that together make up the Greater Sonnenberg Church. We visit one of the more remote ones, which houses a Swiss Anabaptist archive and museum. The Canton of Bern didn't originally control the year of the Jura, but eventually they did send Teufer hunters to track down the Anabaptists. Because of this, like so many other places in Switzerland, the Mennonites in the area were forced to meet together and worship in secret. Besides moving around from home to home, they met under bridges and in caves. The Anabaptist Bridge, not far from the town of Corgamot, was one such place. A cave called the Church of the Goats is another. To get to the not easy to find Church of the Goats, one must hike up a moderately steep trail in a remote area to find the good sized cave. Chances are the Schnecks, who settled around the village of Corgamont, would have been familiar with both the Church of the Goats and the Anabaptist Bridge. Many people who fled and were deported would have passed through the northwestern city of Basel on the Rhine River. Basel sits at the corner of where Switzerland, Germany, and France meet. Like Zurich, Basel itself started running Anabaptists out of the city from early on. In spite of that, a church body of Mennonites remains there today. The Blanks were one such family that fled Basel. Dr. Johannes Hans Blank, born in Basel in 1715, was my sixth great-grandfather. Tradition says that one evening while Dr. Blank was away on a house call, that a band of Anabaptist haters destroyed his home. His wife, Magdalena, fled through the back door taking their two-week-old child with her. She and her baby escaped across the Rhine River into Germany, traveling through deep snow all night. A black dog she met on the path led her to the home of friends who she stayed with until Magdalena and the good doctor were reunited. It was about 11 years later that Dr. Blank and his family sailed to America on the ship Queen of Denmark, arriving in Philadelphia on October 4, 1751. They initially settled in the new Amish community of Berks County, Pennsylvania, and eventually moved to Lancaster County. 
Johannes Hans Blank continued to serve there as a doctor. You know, I in particular am so glad that Dr. Blank's family escaped across the Rhine that night and made their way to America. His oldest daughter, Anna Blank, married my fifth great-grandfather, Joseph Hochstetler. Joseph Hochstetler was the grandson of the same Jacob Hochstetler who was kicked out of Winterkraut by the Anabaptist hunters and moved to Alsace, France. Also, Dr. Blank's third daughter, Catherine Blank, married another fifth great-grandfather of mine, Johannes Hooley. Now, where would I be without the Blanks? After many years of Anabaptist families fleeing to the Jura and German Palatinate, families had multiplied to the point where it was getting crowded. Additionally, in the Palatinate, the authorities were going back on their promises of tax exemptions, all while the Catholic Church continued their persecution of the Anabaptists. The Thirty Years' War had taken its toll on the land, making it difficult to farm. People were tired of running, but moving again was still sounding pretty good. During the 1680s, pacifist Quaker William Penn recruited many to inhabit the 45,000 square miles of land he'd been given by King Charles II of England. This included Mennonites and Amish. Among Penn's attractive promises to the immigrants was freedom of religion. They would be able to worship and live in a way their faith dictated without worry of being put to death, tortured, or exiled. That had to sound pretty good. The French Revolution was the beginning of the end of persecution of Anabaptists in Switzerland and the surrounding areas. The old regime of royals and controlling aristocracy was being violently displaced throughout much of Europe by Napoleon. In 1798, Switzerland became completely overrun by the French and was renamed the Helvetic Republic. Switzerland became a battlefield as war raged between France and Austria. By the time the fighting had stopped and Switzerland's new government had been established in 1815, the government-led persecution of Anabaptists had finally ended. Descendants of the Evangelical Reformed Church of Zurich met on June 26, 2004 and corporately confessed their sins of the 16th century persecutions. They asked descendants of the first Anabaptists to forgive them. A historical marker was placed on the bank of the Lamont River in Zurich where Felix Manns was drowned almost 500 years earlier. There's so much more to see in Switzerland other than where the Anabaptists got their start, lived, and were persecuted. Switzerland's beauty is perhaps unsurpassed anywhere in the world. Now that it's safe for Anabaptists and everybody else to travel there, I can't recommend it more highly. It's safe and clean. There's cowbells tinkling in the countryside and church bells always going in the city. It's beautiful, it's full of historical sites, and it's tasty. Go ahead and take a look back in your ancestry a couple of generations and see if you don't see some of the same names that are listed and mentioned in this video. I totally get it if one day we meet and you come up to me and say, how you doing, cousin? Well, even if your ancestors never even heard of Switzerland, that's okay, too. What happened almost 500 years ago with the Anabaptists really has nothing to do with my family's ancestry, and it has everything to do with putting God's truth, as found in the Bible, over the traditions of men, the laws of the government, and even the doctrines of the church where they've gotten off track. It's up to every follower of Jesus today to do the same thing. Thank you so much. I hope we meet over a pot of cheese fondue one day. God bless. Come on, Copper, let's go.